Good afternoon, everybody, and many thanks to Anne for the kind introduction and to Gordon, of course, to invite me to this interesting place. So it must be very difficult, hard decision for you to come in here instead of sitting outside on the beach. So I try to, um, I, I, I did a pretty basic uh, talk because I was asked by Gordon to introduce glycobiology to people that are probably not in it their everyday life in contact with glycanes. And initially, I choose a pretty uh, complex title. And when I tried to match all the aspects that Gordon asked me to address, which is specifically lectins, under this title, I realized actually only yesterday night that this will not work out. And what I did is I simply changed titles. So I'm now talking about sialoglycanes and lectins. That makes life a bit easier for me and hopefully also for you. And as repetitio est mater studiosus, this slide may show up several times, even in this afternoon session. I suppose also Sabine will have that slide, <laughs> or a variation of it, no? <laughs> but probably not. Uh. John Hanover. So, for a third time, the glycocalyx, so cells from outside, are sugar. This is what we know for long. And the sugars are not loosely attached to the surface, but they are part of glycoconjugates. And we talked already a lot about glycoproteins. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong button. We talked already a lot about glycoproteins, but we have in the same amount, probably in some tissues even larger amount, of glycane carriers, and these are the lipids. So glycolipids, of course, must be acknowledged in this context. So these scaffolds can be glycosylated, as Anne told us, in a very complex manner. And I am focusing on the terminal sugars, which is the salic acid, why do I talk about salic acids mostly? This is pretty simple. The salic acids are the outermost sugars. If a salic acid occurs, it always is, an, is the terminal sugar in a, sh in, a, in a glycane. And even so, it is ignorant to show all the, res the other sugars in gray, as I do here, I do it just for simplicity, and I did it because I knew Anne has introduced all the sugar uh, structures before I'm going to talk. So salic acids, as a rule, are terminal sugars, and they are very big. So if you compare a hexose, in this case it is glucose, to the salic acid, you see salic acid is significantly bigger. So it, it covers, more or less, the m outermost surface of an animal cell. Then we have a total of 20 enzymes in mammals, for instance. We have 20 enzymes that are just busy to transfer salic acid onto carrier proteins. And we have different linkages in which the salic acids can be added. So the most common ones are alpha to, a, alpha to 6 or alpha to 3. And these linkages can be used to, to put salic acid onto a penultimate sugar that is not salic acid. If a salic acid is added to another salic acid, it is always an alpha to 8 linkage. There is in, at least in the mammalian system, hardly any exception from that. It matters which way a salic acid is linked to a penultimate sugar, and this I show, I hope, can you hear me properly with this distance? Yeah. Um, so when you have, sorry, uh, the salic acid in alpha to three linkage to the penultimate sugar, as it is shown here, you have a stretched configuration, and if it is alpha to six, you have a completely different structure. So it, it makes a lot of information whether you have salic acid added in alpha to three, alpha to six, or alpha to eight linkage. I unfortunately don't have such a nice uh, 
slide for the alpha-2-8 linkage. On top of all this complexity, we have modifications on the sugar core, on the salic acid itself. And one of these modifications, and the most common modification in this sense, oh, sorry, is O-acetylation. O-acetylation can occur in, on O position at position 7 and at O in position six, uh, nine, sorry, 9. And what this O-acetylation does with the sugar will be explained a little later. First of all, I wanted to sum up the levels of information storage in a glycome or in this particular case in the sialome. So we, at the first level, we have the salic acid structure itself, so modifications on the salic acid, and I'm only talking about uh, N-acetyl neuraminic acid here in this lecture. I completely leave out the other core structures of salic acid that we have in fish or, or animals uh, different from humans. Then it matters on whether we have the, sugar, the salic acid linked to a galactose or a glu glu uh, glucosamine. It matters which type of glycosidic linking, linkage we are looking at. It matters what is underneath the, the sialo addition. It matters on whether we add to a protein or a lipid. And of course, it matters how many neighbors you have in this glyco array on one or on multiple different scaffolds. And finally, it matters how all these sial or sialoglycanes, all these uh, structures are presented in the, in, the, in the lateral plane of the bilayer membrane, so at the surface of the cell. So we have multiple levels of information, and I really like the conceptualization that Ajit Vaki choose to demonstrate how complex the information of the glycome is. Oh, permanently using the wrong button. So Ajit compared it with the canopy of a forest. So, and he, he called the, the, the acceptor structure in total, the, 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 the tree, the stem region. Then we have the salic acids, which form the leaf of these, the branches and the leaves. So we have here the stem and the, and the branches. And then we add the leaves in form of salic acid. And then what I wanted to add in this picture here is we also have modified salic acid with phosphates, with sulfates, with O-acetylation. And this I call now the